thank you all for coming. My name is Jane. I'm a consultant to Riverscape. Um, for nearly 15 years, Riverscape has focused on the beautification and redevelopment of the Wabash River in Vigo County. Riverscape is pleased to bring waterways to West Terre Haute, one of six small towns in Indiana to host this exhibit. Um, waterways is a Smithsonian Institute traveling exhibit. How many of you have been over there to come go see it yet? Yeah. Fantastic. So we already know what we're talking about. I'm going to remind you that the exhibit is open until four o'clock today. So if you haven't seen it yet and you still have time after your lunch hour, you still have time. It's open till four. Of course, it's will be here till January 2nd. Um, but alongside the Smithsonian exhibit, we also have a companion exhibit called Pearls of the Wabash, which is a fascinating display of our local history um, in relation to mussels. Um, and we are very excited to partner with the Vigo County Public Library to offer this um, the Waterway Speaker Series and have speakers like Cassie Hoswald join us today. Okay, so from Native, so um, today Cassie has worked on conservation issues for the Nature Conservancy in Indiana for over 20 years. As a freshwater ecologist focusing on aquatic habitats, Cassie tends to think about the intersection of rural land use and water quality and how it impacts the health of Indiana's rivers and streams. She owns a bachelor's degree from Butler University and a master's of biology degree from the University of Louisville. So let's all give a warm welcome to Cassie and thank you for traveling over here. Yeah, happy to. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna say I've done several talks related to the waterways exhibit around the state and this is uh, my best turnout so far. So uh, momentum is building, but thank you all for, for um, being here this morning, this, this afternoon. Uh, so we'll dive right in. We have, I have an hour, I think, with you all, but um, I won't talk for an hour. I'll try definitely not to talk for an hour and leave some time for questions at the end. Um, and I will say that um, as I've given this talk around the state, people uh, give me information as I'm, as I'm talking. And so I'm trying to incorporate what I learned from each community that I'm in into my next talk. And so I'm open to, um, especially since you guys actually are focusing on mussels for your waterway, the portion of your waterways exhibit, the local portion, um, I, I you know, value information. So um, you know, chime in as I'm talking. Don't, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt me and, and offer interjections or questions. So um, this picture to start out is really an exciting picture to me. And the reason is, uh, th these are not my hands, but these are someone's hands and these are freshwater mussels of different species, so a variety there, um, and they're babies. Those are all young mussels. And so that's an exciting thing to see. Um, this picture actually was taken in um, Kentucky, and actually no, Southern Indiana, um, near, near, Kentucky, near the Ohio River. Um, and, and so it, those are baby mussels, and that's what's really exciting to see in our rivers is when we see reproduction. Uh, we have lots of old mussels, but not in a lot of places we don't have a lot of young mussels. So just a little bit about me to kind of understand where I'm coming from. Um, I uh, am from Corydon, Indiana, near Louisville, Kentucky. My husband and I uh, have spent the last 11 years in Kokomo and just recently have moved to Bloomington, Indiana. So we're happy to be south of Indianapolis and uh, a little bit closer to home. And these, we, we don't have children, but we have dogs. Uh, we have flat-coated retrievers, and uh, they are water dogs. They love the water. And really, um, as I'm working across the state, I work throughout the Wabash River Basin, so two-thirds of Indiana, um, as well as the Blue River, where I kind of cut my teeth. And um, I use my dogs as sort of a, a barometer of water quality. And if I let them swim in a river or stream, it means to me I know something about it that makes it clean enough for them to not get sick. Um, but mussels really are where my passion is and where I think what I think about in terms of a bioindicator or a barometer of, of water quality in the state. So the outline for today is that we'll, we'll do a little bit of freshwater mussels 101. I know there have been some other talks about mussels, so hopefully this is not um, all redundant information for you all. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the river habitats in Indiana, uh, human mussel interactions, and finally, um, what uh, is being done to keep Indiana's rivers healthy. So I like to start out just talking about the variety of mussels that we have. And so uh, these are beautiful shells, of course, beautiful animals. All of these occur in Indiana. And uh, really what I like are these names. They're very colorful, along with the shells. They're colorful and they're, the names are sort of descriptive of what you're seeing here. So an elephant ear, and I'll pass this one around. This is an elephant ear shell. This is a small one, in fact. Um, but you can see it sort of, you could imagine creatively looks like an elephant's ear. And I'll pass that around just so you can get a feel for, 
for what that is, that animal. And so that's, of course, without the muscle in it, so it's a little bit lighter than it would be otherwise. But these names really speak to the fact that early on, when Indiana was settled, when the eastern U.S. was settled, people encountered these with some frequency to come up with names that are you know, clever like this. So pink heel splitter, it's pretty easy to see why someone might call it that. If you're walking in a stream and you step on that thing, you could uh, conceivably split your heel open and they, they of course have a beautiful pink um, nacre inside of the shell. And so this, this is just a smattering of names. There's all kinds of cool names for these animals and really any kind of uh, species of animal or plants, when you trees, when you start studying it, start studying them and start looking at the different um, types, you start seeing the, the nuances and the beauty in them. But when I say muscle, you might not have a picture of any of these in your mind, but they are, there is a lot of variety. So um, I think I'm going to try the pointer here. Yeah. Um, maybe it's not. I uh, can't really use that. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's too, I can't quite get it there. It's okay. Um, so as I said, the uh, freshwater muscle, the largest muscle in, the, in a freshwater muscle is the foot. And the foot is this, you can see it labeled, it's the piece of the, the muscle, the really heavy tissue piece that keeps it uh, secure in a stream, helps it to, to stay put. And so um, muscles are, are not um, mobile, they're, they're pretty sedentary in their life, lifestyle, they'll stay in the same place in a river for their whole life. Um, and, and it's that foot that keeps them there. Now they can move, you know, from, from me to you, they, they can move within a stream, but they don't move far, they're very sedentary. Um, and then they have in-current, ex-current siphons, so they're, they're bringing water in and, and pushing water out. Uh, they, a, a freshwater mussel, one mussel, can filter up to 15 gallons of water a day. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's a keg of beer, one mussel. Uh, and we have hundreds of thousands of these things in our water, so they really are our little uh, you know, uh, treatment plants in, the, in, the, uh, in our rivers and streams. Um, the, I think yesterday maybe there was, or yesterday evening there was a presentation on um, shells and, and how to age um, freshwater mussel shells. Now uh, that, that shell that's, that's tracking around there, it's not exact, but you can kind of look at the, I'm just going to walk over here and point out these, um, these lines kind of indicate a year, not exactly, it's not a, that's definitely you would, you would cross section this and actually count the rings to get a, 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 an accurate age. But you know, this one's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plus, you know, it's, it's a, you know, that, that's an older animal, 20 plus years. So you can use the shell, you can use those rings to estimate age. I once um, estimated the age of some elephant ear mussels in the Blue River. Um, and the youngest was 45 and the oldest was 72. Mussels can live over 100, well over 100 years. So they, they're longer lived than we are in many cases. And so they're exposed to our environment and they tell us a lot about what the quality of water that they're <laughs> filtering every single day, day in and day out. They can shut down their filtering. Uh, they do shut down their filtering. In fact, in the winter, in the cold months, they'll, they'll kind of bury down into the substrate of the river and those growth rings stop or slow down dramatically in the winter months. So those, those growth rings are kind of like a plant or a tree. They're putting on you know, growth in the, in the warm parts of the year when there's a lot of food available and conditions are right. So again, these are different species and they have you know, their, their foot down in the water. So this is you know, the, the river bed. And so you can see just a little bit of that muscle is above the river surface and they can move you know, down into the water when, when you get um, uh, maybe a really hot time of the, the summer when water levels are low, they might move down, then they're not feeding and that's the time of year when they wanna feed. So you wouldn't want that happening very often, but more often in the winter, they move down to sort of seek shelter in the, in the substrate and they're not feeding as much. This is an actual muscle in substrate so here's the bottom of the river. This is the Blue River. And just this piece of the shell is above the river surface. This is a lure, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Different mussels have different lures to attract fish. Um, but when you're searching for mussels, when you're actually in the river looking for them, you, you can sometimes visually search, you know, if the water's not too deep or if the water's really clear. Um, more often than not, you're putting on a mask and snorkel or scuba gear. I do not scuba dive. I'm, I'm claustrophobic, I can't do that, but I do mask and snorkel a lot, and it really makes them show up. But it's kind of, I compare it to um, searching for uh, morels in the springtime. You have to sort of train your eye each spring to find those mushrooms. 
Uh, same thing with mussels. When you get, first get in a river, you kind of got to get your you know, wits about you and, and look around. I tend to hyperventilate the first time I hop in a river every single time. And then, uh, then you start finding them, and you're really looking for just these little slits that's that, that incurrent siphon where they're, they're filtering, and that's what you're looking for in a river. So um, this, I don't know if this will play or not. It's just a little video. This is that pink heel splitter muscle I was talking about earlier. So you can see that really strong um, keel is what we would call that on that muscle. Um, it's pretty distinct. It might, it's a little video that just kind of shows the different sides of the muscle, but it doesn't, I didn't, wasn't able to get that to play, which is fine. I do have another video I, I will want to figure out. So uh, this is just, I, I've already shared, up to 15 gallons of water a day for one mussel. So they really are the, the um, sort of the kidneys of our river systems, and they provide a, 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 a seriously good water quality benefit. So they're processing all that water, and then they create something called pseudo feces, which comes back out the excurrent siphon, and that feeds other things in the, in the food web of our, of our rivers and streams. So uh, what's the most fascinating thing about a mussel is their, their reproductive strategy. So they are um, parasites in their larval form. And if you recall from Biology 101, a parasite is something that takes something from its host and doesn't, the host doesn't really get anything out of it. And so mus freshwater mussels are parasites on fish. And some mussels use all different kinds of fish species, and some mussels only have one fish species that they use. And so sometimes when you don't find a particular species in a river, um, it has nothing to do with the water quality or the habitat. It's, it's that their fish host is not there. Maybe it's not in that river system any longer. Maybe it's, you know, numbers are depressed for whatever reason. And so th there are male and female mussels. They, they tend to not look different, although some species will be sexually dimorphic. So the male will you know, put the sperm in the water, the female will take them in, and she broods her larvae. We have short-term and long-term brooders. Some, some mussels brood just over the summer, and they release their larvae in the fall. And then others will brood their larvae over the winter and release in the spring. And so that kind of gives you a clue as to what kind of fish they use. So if they, if they brood them over the summer, they are targeting most likely fish that get congregated in the late summer uh, when you have low water levels. Droughts are really good for mussel reproduction, actually, because it concentrates the fish. And if you remember, I said that mussels are sedentary. They do not move within a river system. But fish are how they move within and between rivers. So they have to get on the fish, and then the, they'll carry, the, the, the larvae will stay on the fish gills for, you know, 20 to 30 days and then they'll drop off when they've got what they need, and hopefully they land in a river substrate that's good for them to grow and continue uh, to live there. This is a very precarious life cycle, uh, and so they produce thousands and thousands of larvae in hopes that a few of them actually have success on a fish. So this is the video I wanna show, so I've gotta figure out how to make this play. But what, what you're gonna see here, this is inside a lab, so this is sort of a contrived environment, but Different mussels have different strategies for attracting their fish host. A few slides back, I showed you a, a mussel that had a lure uh, that looked like a fish, if you could imagine that, and it waves that, that lure to attract the fish to it, to bite the lure, and then it releases its larvae and, and the cycle goes on. Some mussels just distribute their larvae into the water column, and that would be a fish that tends to eat in the middle layer of the river, kind of in the pelagic zone. This mussel uh, is the snuff box, and as you'll see, its, its host fish is a log perch. Log perch like to go along the bottom and kind of roll stones, um, and they, they tend to like really clean water. And this mussel, I, I won't give away its strategy, we'll see it here if I can figure out how to make this work. Ah. Sorry. Should I check this before? I keep touching the screen. It's not a touch screen. <laughs> hmm. I don't know how to get the... I don't know where my um, little pointer is. Ah, this is, this is just a key to understanding the, ah, there we go. So 
So these are, the, these are her gills. With, they're just charged with larvae. And she's kind of moving herself around there a little bit to say, hey, I'm here. So that muscle just grabbed that fish. She actually has a hold of it. And right now, there are thousands of, of you know, larvae being put on the gills of that fish. You remember, it's not good to kill your host, so she won't put so many on there that it kills the fish. Um, in fact, there is some uh, research that says that as uh, fish age, they become immune to uh, the, the larvae, so it's younger fish that the muscles are sort of targeting. Whether, whether that's true or not, I, I can imagine that's true. But you can also imagine that that fish is going to get smart and maybe think the next time before <laughs> rolling something like that over. I, I don't know how much fish think or not, but uh, we, they, they say animals are smarter than we are. So um, anyway, the point being, this muscle uses a specific fish host, and it's really attract. It's really developed a strategy to attract that particular host. Others are very, you know, generalist. Okay, well, so let's talk a little bit about some of the river habitats in Indiana, and I've just um, sort of selected a couple across the state that are sort of representative of what you might find. Um, I, I mentioned that I work in the Wabash River Basin, so that's you know most of two-thirds of Indiana. I also um, did, I worked for about 15 years exclusively in the Blue River, which is not in the Wabash Basin, but is a direct tributary to the Ohio. So I'm not as familiar with the rivers in, in the northern part of the state um, or their mussel fauna. So uh, disclaimer there. So uh, first we'll talk about the Tippecanoe River, the best mussel stream in Indiana. Um, and if you talk to mussel um, biologists, malacologists, um, across the eastern U.S. They, they all know about the Tippecanoe River because it is so diverse in its mussel fauna. And so you, you might wonder, well, why, how is that? Why is that? Um, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, very heavy um, in row crop agriculture, which doesn't tend to go so well for water quality and for mussel outcomes. But uh, really what we think are the keys to success there are that, one, it's a groundwater fed system. So there's a lot of water that rises up from the river bed versus running into the river from the, the land. Um, there also are a lot, is a lot of riparian buffer. And riparian is that area that occurs right along the river um, that, that uh, you know, some, in some places you see, you know, corn being grown right up to the edge of the riverbank and, and the, you know, the, the um, field falling in, a row every year falling in. Um, in other places, um, you can plant trees. There are trees planted, and this watershed does tend to have a lot of that. So a lot of stream shading, which keeps the river, which keeps the river cooler and the oxygen levels higher, which, is, which are good for fish, which are then good for mussels. So um, sort of a representative um, mussel or, or fish even um, is the um, spotted darter here. Uh, darters are little bitty fish that um, occur in the, the white water part of a river. So where you see, when you see, when you look at a river and you see white water falling over stones, it's a change in the elevation of the river. And so you tend to get more exposed um, gravels and such, which is what the darters are wanting. There's a number of species of darter. And so they, they like to lay their eggs there. They like to feed there. And so some of these smaller mussels, like the raid bean, um, it's a federally endangered animal. They will use small fish like darters, and those tend to be mussels that live close to those riffles, those whitewater areas of streams. And so um, the Tippecanoe River has a lot of federally endangered mussel species, and, and it retains a lot of those. In fact, it's, um, it, it sort of is a source population for reintroduction efforts a lot of times because there's, there are enough animals there that you don't feel bad about taking five females and, and using them to... Um, be nursery nurse, nurses for, for other places. So um, I, I told you that I've given this talk a number of places, and one of those places was in Laporte, Indiana, where Skits came to, to see me talk, um, which was my first one, by the way. Um, and so uh, I, I felt compelled to, to say something about the Kankakee River. Now, um, if you don't know this book, Rivers of Indiana by Richard Simons, I would highly recommend it. It sort of is just an overview of, a, a nice overview of the history of the different rivers in Indiana. He has them categorized different ways. And I think this is an interesting description that really the Kankakee used to be uh, a, a giant wetland. It really uh, was, didn't follow any particular course. And through time, uh, man has made that river follow a course. And there are a lot of problems with the 
with the Kankakee River as a result, um, not least of which is that the substrate is not very stable in that river any longer. It's very sandy. And so um, I, I showed you that picture with the mussels and their foot in the river. That's really important to their survival. They have to have something stable. They do not live every, never have they lived everywhere in a river. They live in what we call beds. Um, they're very patchy in their distribution. And so uh, in those particular beds, they're there because those are st the stable areas of a river. And so in the Kankakee now, and I learned this from speaking in Laporte, um, the mussels are found on the edges of that river system. They're not found in the middle of the river, and that's because it's very shifty. It isn't stable. It's very sandy, and it constantly is moving. So what is the fish and mussel interaction that, that sort of typifies the Kankakee. Um, this is a black sand shell mussel. Really, they can be really big mussels. And one of the hosts for black sand shell is the sauger. And sauger populations are doing well in the tip, in the, I'm sorry, in the Kankakee River, but not really well in the Indiana portion of the Kankakee. And the Indiana is where we straightened the Kankakee. And when you go across into Illinois, it starts becoming what I would describe as a wild river again. It's not channelized. And more of the sauger are living in the, on the Illinois side where the habitat is a little bit better for them. Um, and then, of course, I'm in Terre Haute. I have to talk about the Wabash River, right? It's, it's, I love this quote by Richard Simons. Uh, for, for, you know, for other people, the Wabash is Indiana. When, when people talk about Indiana, they think of the Wabash River. We may not think, it's, we may not think that much about it, but um, it's, uh, it drains two-thirds of the state of Indiana. And it is um, a very significant river for, the, for many reasons. Uh, it retains, um, of the 151 native fish to the Wabash, there are only three that are missing. It retains almost all of its, its original fish fauna. And that is because from its confluence with the Ohio River, upstream 411 miles to Huntington, Indiana, it is an undammed river. There aren't dams on the Wabash River, you all well know that. And that allows fish to have the movement within the stream that they need, um, and, and then hence the mussels come along with that. And so that's why the Nature Conservancy is working in the Wabash River Basin, is because there's so much um, left to work with there. So um, that is uh, um, a very special thing. And so, you know, the river looks different, different places you go, uh, you know, throughout its length. Um, it can, you know, but it, it in general is a, a broad, uh, slow river. And in the lower Wabash, so, so the um, uh, New Harmony, Posey County, that kind of area, there are lots of um, oxbow lakes. And this is the largest oxbow lake in Indiana, as shown right here. Uh, it's eight miles <laughs> around to its confluence with the Ohio River. And, and now that what, what the lake does, see the lake goes this way and the river goes this way. The river once went, this went around here and we had a flood in 2008 or nine in central Indiana that created a new lake. Basically the river cut a new channel. So there's a lot of power, a lot of water um, in the Wabash, certainly. You all know that, I see pictures of floods um, on the walls here. So, um, again, there are really... Can we go over a question? No, go ahead. I'm, we have an ox bowl in Terre Haute. Okay. And it's not... Uh, um, flood has not cut through it, but I've been curious about that particular feature of the Wabash. Uh-huh. Do you have any sense of what that's done to the balance of nature? Was it been a good thing for the river or a bad thing? Um, I, I think it's a good thing. Um, if you, if I owned land there, I probably wouldn't think it was a good thing because that land got separated from me and I can't drive to it anymore. Um, so it depends on your perspective, right? Um, so that, that oxbow that I showed was created unnaturally because of that large flood. Naturally. Well, un, unnaturally in a way, and here's, here's why. Um, the Wabash, of course, we had, I, I think it was 11 inches of rain and like a 14 hour period in central Indiana. It's the flood that, that flooded Columbus, Indiana. Um, hospital and, and all. Um, that water then, when it hit the Ohio, 
uh, it was in June. It was a June flood. So we, we tend to flood in April, May. By June, we're not thinking about flooding so much. So the Ohio River is controlled for navigational traffic. And the, the river level was fairly low. And so what it did was created a, a head. Uh, you know, a, and I'm not a hydrologist, but it, it created a waterfall at the end of Indiana into the Ohio River to the point where so much sediment was dumped in the Ohio River from that new cut that it closed traffic. They had to dredge to open, reopen barge traffic on the Ohio. So it was unnatural in that we, we, we control the level of the Ohio River. That's not natural. That isn't what, but it happens. I mean, it's natural now, but it isn't really a natural phenomenon. So um, now those Oxbow Lakes, you can look at a Google map and I would encourage you all to do that after this. You can see the scars on the land of where the river has been in the past and probably where it will go again. And that's the to me, the beauty of the Wabash is that it is wild and it can move around and create new places. Um, we have been doing some sediment sampling, some cores of some of the Oxbow Lakes in the lower Wabash. And to understand how old they are and how long they'll persist on the landscape before a new one is formed. And uh, one of the ones we've, we've surveyed on, actually on the lower White River, or cord, is uh, 1,800 years old. It has, um, I'm sorry, it's 1,400 years old. It has uh, 18 feet of sediment in the, in the bottom of that lake. And the top six feet have been laid down in the last 200 years. So we're accelerating the, the, the filling in of those lakes from our sediment coming upstream in the excess water. So it's a, Indiana's not natural anymore. So it is a natural process, but it's being accelerated by us. That's the shortest answer. Not a short one, sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> wow. I don't know. Um, I, I think you could, I think what you can do is just look at where a river is migrating. You know, you could go out right now and look at where, where is the river, um, gaining, you know, any, any river is, is gaining ground on one side typically and losing on the other. And so you could not, I don't know that you could ever say it's going to happen, you know, in the next year, but if you get, a uh, 100 year, 500 year flood, which we know we're getting more frequently, probably that's gonna happen sooner rather than later. So it, yeah, it's, uh, it's not a, an exact science, I'll say that, but you can, I, I don't think anybody was expecting that to happen 12 years ago on the lower Wabash, but, we, but, but then it happened again, actually. It, it back, there's two islands there now, so it actually happened twice. And we did know that was going to happen because you could just look at where the river was wanting to go. So that was a once-in-a-lifetime thing to, yeah. Yes? I don't mean to hijack the presentation, but <laughs> since he's gone on <laughs> Yeah. And you said, I think, that the oxbow that occurred is a positive feature. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I guess you said some of the, some of the scraping on which river was that? The Kankakee, Kankakee. uh huh, which right. doesn't even impact the Wabash. That's that's draining to the Illinois River. Right. Um, in in fact, the the Kankakee is looking right now. The Indiana portion is looking at um, sort of facilitating oxbows as a way to help with their um, destabilization of the stream. There's a lot of things being looked at, but that is one of the um, potential answers. And then I know. Um, in Iowa, I have coworkers out there who are working on putting in ox, they're, they're really small, like, you know, one acre oxbow lakes as a way to, um, kind of a, a wetland on the edge of a, of a river to store basically a nutrient, um, sink to sink nutrients and sediment there versus letting it export down river. We can talk more about that after. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so anyway, th this, uh, the paddlefish, the, the picture on the left, um, that was taken from that big oxbow that I was just uh, showing you. And uh, this, this photo was taken on Halloween. On November 1st, um, uh, paddle f paddlefish can be harvested on the Ohio River, but they can't be harvested in the Wabash. And so this animal, along with a lot of other females, were, were there uh, loafing in that oxbow lake. So the oxbow lakes do provide a, uh, uh, you know, an ecosystem service, if you will. 
And this uh, fish is a lake sturgeon. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm just pointing out that they're sort of um, capitalizing on that clean gravel. And then a rainbow darter would be another, uh, just, you know, variety of darter species, and they're gorgeous. But they're kind of like our um, spring songbirds. They, they color up in the spring, and then a lot of the year, they're really hard to identify because they don't have any color. So uh, th this is just sort of the namesake for the uh, Wabash River is a Wabash pig toe, meaning this species was described from the Wabash River. It was so common in the Wabash that this is where its you know, place name is. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then I, I told you that the Blue River is, is where I did a lot of my work. It's where my interest in mussels originated. And so the Blue River is a tributary to the Ohio. It's a very sm small river system, um, has a really high gradient. So, um, so it doesn't collect sediment, basically. What that means is there's enough fall in the river that sediments don't accumulate well, like, like they do in the Wabash that's low and slow. They wash on through. Um, so that's a, a good thing and a bad thing, but uh, there, there isn't a lot of sediment that accumulates there. It is a karst watershed, meaning uh, it's cave fed, and you guys probably have heard of Marengo Cave and, and Cave Country Canoes. And, and, and so um, all that water that's flowing underground um, Again, kind of like the Tippecanoe River, and I talked about the, the high oxygen level. Um, in the Blue River, water is really cold coming into the stream. Mussels don't grow as fast there because they are you know, dependent on temp water temperature and their growth. Um, but the high oxygen level does facilitate a lot of the fish that they need. And uh, sort of a fish that typifies the Blue River is smallmouth. If anybody here is a fisherman, you, you may have fished in the Blue River. If you haven't, you should. Um, we also removed um, some dams last year in Big Indian Creek, which is in the, Wab which, which is in the Blue River watershed. Um, and the smallmouth bass fishery the response to that in a year's time has been amazing. Uh, they are a fish host for this beautiful mussel called a wavy rayed lamp mussel. And uh, we've been experimenting with um, adding some of those back into the Blue River. Uh, it's a state rare species, but it's very common in the Blue River, um, partially because of that water quality and partially because the, there's a lot of smallmouth bass there. And then um, I passed around that elephant ear shell. That is the species that got me interested in freshwater mussels, and I actually did my master's research on it. Um, so that's the shell. This is the Blue River and as it flows through Harrison Crawford State Forest. And you can see the Ohio River in the very background of that picture. Uh, so it's a good water quality stream. Uh, a lot of riparian buffer, the, the, you know, the land use is good. Why is this mussel, the youngest one I can find is 45 years old? There's no babies. That's concerning. So I set out to understand what the fish host was for this animal and was this animal uh, reproductively viable even. And so we, we, we brought them into a lab and they reproduced like crazy. So it wasn't, they're, they're geriatric, but they're still, you know, reproductively viable. Um, but we then tried, then tried to infect fish, different fish species with um, the, the larvae. And there was some early 1900 literature that said that uh, skipjack herring was the host for this mussel. And I, first of all, couldn't source skip, skipjack herring, couldn't find any. And so I used gizzard shad as a surrogate because they're, the, they're both in a her the herring family. Couldn't keep, uh, couldn't keep uh, gizzard shad alive in the lab. They're a very flighty fish. Someone described them. If you look at them funny, they'll keel over and die. So, and they did <laughs> in large numbers. We tried. Um, so basically, my, my master's research was telling people what species don't work for this. It never identified which species did. But someone at Auburn was able to pick that up and then figure out a way, a method to keep them alive in the lab, which was a round tank. Duh, that makes sense, right? Um, and so the skipjack herring is, in fact, the host for this, the only host for this mussel. And because of the locks and dams on the Ohio River, the skipjack, which is a herring, which makes a spring run, herring, you know, run up streams in the spring, uh, it, it doesn't happen in, in the numbers that it once did. And remember, mussels depend on large numbers of fish to encounter large numbers of larvae. And when you have mussels that are now spread out, you don't have enough of the fish, um, you don't see reproduction. And that's, that's kind of occurring throughout the range of this animal, except in a few places in Alabama and Tennessee. So um, there, you know, is sort of some talk, well, what should we do about this? And until you fix that problem with the locks and dams, you, there's really no point in, in trying to bolster the population except to, you know, preserve the genetics 
but people at a higher pay grade than me within the Nature Conservancy are working with the Army Corps on how can we reoperate these locks and dams to pass more fish through, um, and in which case maybe we can get skipjack herring back. When you say they move up stream, are they coming from Ohio or are they coming from well, they're, they're coming from farther than just the Ohio, that they would be coming from, you know, maybe not the Gulf itself, but way down in the watershed. Um, so, yeah. There's also, like, Alabama shad that kind of move up the Appalachia, App Appalachicola River. Um, and and there have been some experiments done with how to get them. There's some locks and dams there that aren't used anymore. And so how do you move these fish through? And they opened them up. They opened up some of the locks and dams, but the fish didn't move through. And so they figured out that they're auditory. They, they have a, an auditory cue to falling. Remember I said the Blue River kind of falls? They, they cue in on that sound. So they put these just cheap fountains for like from Lowe's in the lock chambers, and that worked. Um, so, so, you know, it sort of spurred some thinking, hmm, maybe we should put some, you know, cheap, you know, um, fountains in the lower Blue River to get them in there. And we, and I have found skipjack in there, young one, young of the year, just not many. Yeah. So um, how many mussels are, are there? You know, the North America is the epicenter for freshwater mussels. Indiana historically had about 77, had 77 species. Over 50% of those are now considered endangered. Um, and so m most of them are still found in a few places, but there are some that are now extinct. Um, and this is another video, just uh, this, this one, let's see if I can get it. Um, this video is a, a, mus a fish, I'm sorry, a mussel survey that we did this summer, fall, in um, Fish Creek, which is a tributary to Western Lake Erie Basin, so way up in northern Indiana. But this will just give you, we don't have to watch all of it, but uh, give you an idea of um, how, how you survey for mussels. Doesn't seem like that's playing. Jane, how am I doing on time? I mean, is okay? Well, well, okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll hurry through here. The rest of them shouldn't take that long. I think this is good though. You're very doesn't want to do that for me. I think it's useful to see how you search for these things, but... We're all cheering for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I'll, I'll let that one go. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about human interactions with mussels. Uh, you guys are all here to, to learn about, about them, so clearly there's a curiosity. Uh, and so, so early people, this, is, this, is, this picture is taken from um, the shell mounds uh, near St. Louis, Cahokia, I believe. Um, and these are just disks of shells. So I, I have to think that was decoration of some sort. Na often people ask, you know, did, were they eat, did people eat them? And uh, there is, you know, evidence that, yes, the Native Americans did eat mussels, uh, but it would have taken a bunch of them to actually meet your, your nutritional needs. Uh, so it would probably have been more of a um, subsistence kind of eating, not a preferential eating of them, but de definitely there are lots of um, shell mounds in, in, um, in, in the larger mounds of people that, that lived along these rivers. And then um, we kind of moved into a period where freshwater pearls were the, the early 1900s, turn of the century. Um, pearls started being found in mussel shells, and this is sort of concurrent to the button industry, um, where people were collecting lots of shells to uh, make uh, buttons, pearl buttons out of. Um, but but then someone, you know, of course, found a, a pearl in a in a shell, and people started really, you know, it was kind of like a gold rush in Indiana. Um, and and so this was this account is from Laporte, and then there was an account from um, Maunee or Mounty, Illinois, in the lower 
Wabash near New Harmony um, of people. And I think they said the, the shells went in, I think this was 1903, the shells had been about $4 a ton and they went to $15 a ton. And I'm reminded of how right now people are complaining they can't get workers because everybody's making too much doing this or that. And it was sort of the same thing. Farmers couldn't get farm hands because they were making more money by harvesting shells out of the river and hoping that they found a freshwater pearl in that. But lots and lots of mussels were sacrificed uh, in the hopes of finding a shell, or I'm sorry, in, ho in the hopes of finding a pearl and then those shells could be sent to Iowa where they were finished, made into a finished product. So, um, so that was sort of the first iteration of, of uh, you know, our ancestors using mussel shells. And then, of course, then the pearl button industry really took, hit its stride. And of course, on the Wabash River and the Lower White River, that was a big deal. And so this, um, this person here, and I've got a, a shell um, with th these are you know the the blanks so the the blanks were cut out of this and then used to make polished and holes drilled to make um, buttons and so what they this this uh, contraption is called a crowbar crowfoot bar sorry um, and so it's it's this bar with lots of hooks on it and they would drag those along the riverbed and mussel shells would close on those hooks and then they would pull it up and you can see this gentleman has lots of shells on there. I cannot imagine any, there's nowhere I've been in Indiana that had mussels that you could drag something across and, and collect them like this. That, that I, I can't even imagine that many mussels. So they clearly were dealing with a much larger population than we are now. Um, and the, so the mussels are still really recovering from this um, sort of uh, industry. And this kind of gives you a, another feel for how many mussels we were, we were harvesting. This is taken near Shoals, Indiana. And those men are sitting on, you can see each one of those shells, and some of those are huge. Um, all the, the blanks cut out of those shells. Someone in one of my presentations said, that looks, that reminds me of the buffalo, you know, the buffalo um, pictures that uh, from, you know, about that time period too. So, um, so that, that certainly had an impact on our river. Think about, again, that 15 gallons of water a day and that filtering capacity, which at this time, you know, rivers really weren't polluted yet. Uh, that was coming. Um, and that happened after the pearl button industry collapsed because plastics came on the scene and industrialization. Uh, this is a, a button uh, factory in Leavenworth, Indiana on the Ohio River. And, uh, I gave this talk in Vincennes and they had a place called Pearl City. I don't know if any of you all are familiar with that, but it was an area, um, kind of a, a shanty town of, of people living on riverboats and m making their living off of the, the river. And so, um, so yeah, it was a real, it was a real industry. Um, and then after the um, Pearl Button industry collapsed in the uh, 1930s, um, the cultured pearl industry started to take off. And so cultured pearls, uh, the idea was that you take a blank out of a, a, a North American freshwater mussel shell and you insert it into a, a, an oyster in Japan. They, these were sent, sent to Japan and that's where cultured pearls were made. And the idea was that all women liked pearls and they couldn't afford you know, for people to be going out in our rivers, they, they were just not plentiful enough. And so we can make these things and mass market them. And of course, then, you know, pearls did take off. And um, now, so that, that really was a Japanese market. Um, and in 19, 1990, 91 is when um, muscling was, um, there was no longer a mussel harvest in Indiana. That's when the, the harvest was cut off. And now the only place that I'm aware of that you can still harvest mussels in the, is in the Tennessee River in Tennessee. Um, and that's still for this cultured pearl industry, but it's starting to um, not collapse, but China has figured this out. They've taken this on. But for many, many years, um, pearls, um, sorry, mussels from the Mississippi River Basin were the chosen uh, blanks to start uh, cultured pearls. So all of these things, you know, are just slow, kind of like death by a thousand cuts, all of these different uh, industries. And then um, we, we have, uh, I don't know why that, maybe there's not something else there. Um, uh, at the end of September, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service declared that I think there was 20, spe uh, 20 species that were going to be moved from endangered to extinct. Eight of those were freshwater mussels. Um, so that gives you an idea of the proportion of how uh, endangered this group of animals is, and that's, they, they interact directly with our water, so they're sort of telling us something. Um, this map shows uh, 
how much, these are watershed boundaries that you see on this map. And this is talking, this is showing visually the export of nitrogen to the Gulf of Mexico. So if you look across the Corn Belt, uh, Indiana, northern Indiana, Illinois, and, Ohio, and Iowa predominantly, um, you can see that those are what we call the hottest, air, hottest watersheds for, new, for nitrogen export. And what that's doing is causing a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where nothing can live. Um, and so we, we want to look closer at, at Indiana. Why, you know, if, if these things are, if this much nutrient is coming out of our rivers, what's that doing to our, um, our fauna, not only the Gulf? I mentioned that, that big flood in 2000, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if it was 2008 or 9. This is a field in central Indiana to, to show you an example of how much water ran across that field to lose that much sediment. That's going to cost a lot of money to fix. That's a lot of sediment um, exported and a lot of crop that's just gone. This, this graph shows the top 15 floods on the Wabash River as measured at New Harmony over the last 100 years. And, you know, 10 of those have been in the last 20 years. So we're getting um, probably heavier rain events, but we also are getting really efficient at getting our water away from our cities and towns and fields. And that's part of why all that nitrogen is being exported is because we've got really good drainage in Indiana. So how do we keep our rivers healthy? We'll, we'll, folk, we'll end on, on some positive things here. So um, the Nature Conservancy, along with a lot of other organizations, are really promoting uh, cover crops and soil health uh, to our, you know, most of our land in Indiana is used to grow crops. And so we want to continue to be able to do that. And we aren't going to be able to do that if we export all of our soil um, downstream. And so we are promoting cover crops along with soil testing and, and um, precision uh, application of fertilizer, not just broadcast. Um, and then we also are working on floodplain restoration. We just received um, word that we um, were successful in a, a bid to uh, include to increase the amount of acres that are enrolled in the wetland reserve easement program through the um, federal government uh, on the in the lower Wabash counties and so that you can see that flooding and what that does that allows the sediment and then the nitrogen and the phosphorus to settle out on the land and not be exported downstream it also creates great habitat for fish for birds for ducks um, and then we also are working on thing on what we call edge of field practices, things that keep water where treated where it comes from and not just exported down dirtier than it came off of the field. And so uh, these practices uh, basically work within the confines of a ditch to make it work like a flood, a mini floodplain in a ditch. As regards mussels, we are working um, on reintroductions and augmentations in different places around the state. I mentioned the wavy raid lamp mussel, and that's what this little uh, mussel is here. This little guy's holding one. We had we worked with um, a local um, fourth grade classroom that was learning about Indiana history to learn about the natural history of of um, the Blue River, and we tagged all of those mussels. I'm sure a little bit of super glue, you know, probably glued a few of those things shut, but we, we put in 1,100 mussels in the, in the Blue River, and they are thriving as a result. That, this picture, in fact, shows that. Um, this was the size of the mussel when we put it in the river, and this is how much it grew within a year. So they liked being in the river better than they liked being in the lab, which is wonderful. Um, we also are working now in the Wildcat Creek, which is one of those um, streams that's really, I said, is hot for nitrogen. Um, and trying, there's some places in that stream where there are no mussels left, and we're trying to work with the DNR to understand where, you know, what's going on there. Is it a water quality issue? Is it a stream substrate issue? And so we're putting the mussels, you can see how tiny they are, and we've got little tags on them. Um, and we put them in these things called silos to be able to just go back and, and pull them right out of the river, look at them, because you would lose those. Uh, they're, they're way too small to, to actually keep track of otherwise. And so um, I'm happy to report that we've had actually great growth this summer with those. And, and so we'll, we're holding them over the winter and we'll put them out next summer in, in some, some place there. Um, so that's, that, and these are kidney shell. That's that, mu that particular muscle, which is also a state rare animal. Um, so, in closing, I want to leave you all with a few action steps that you can take to empower you to help uh, keep our rivers clean. And so, uh, think about runoff from your home or your apartment or someplace that you influence. What are you doing to keep the water there and treated before it, it leaves your, your property? Um, tell someone what you learned today. I appreciate you all so much coming out today to learn. And so, tell somebody what you learned about mussels. A lot of people don't know that these exist right under our noses. 
And then, of course, we would, would love to have your support. Um, I also want to uh, give a shout out to DNR, their non-game fund. And I know Brant Fisher is talking next week, maybe. Um, and, and we do a lot of this work, the muscle work, with the DNR, and they can um, certainly use your help. So with that, I will take questions. And thank you all very much for being here. Yes. So are we restoring the muscle population in Indiana, or is it continuing to decline? I would say broadly the, the whole population is um, in some places increasing and in other places declining. So on the whole, I, I would say it's sort of a status quo. Um, what we're trying to do, what my interest is at least, um, is we are taking steps to improve water quality and improve uh, the, the water storing capacity of our land. And so can we, in places where we think we've got it right, can we try to augment or reintroduce and use these as a barometer of success? And so um, the concern is always that we don't want to lose that genetic diversity that we have. So we have to be real. It really, it, it's a lot of back and forth and, and it's not, I, I don't, have any jurisdiction over the muscle population in Indiana. The DNR does. And so it really is sort of a group effort to talk about, well, we've got this species, we have enough of it, let's work with it while, while we still can. And, um, you know, kind of, we talked about the elephant ear. I would love to work with that animal, but I don't feel like the conditions are right to do that right now. So we're not working with that particular species. But it's, you can sort of, um, uh, comfort yourself, I guess, with it's doing well in a few other places. So we always would have something to call upon if it did completely disappear from Indiana. And it's a long time before that happens. But really, the precarious lifestyle of these animals speaks to it. And they need a, they need some intervention. They can't do it on their own because of all the barriers we've put up for them. Water quality might be completely fine, and re the stream is ready for them. They just are. It's going to take so long for them to get there on their own. We need to give them a little hand. So um, there are plans for how you know we are thinking about how to to do that. It's just I think slower than anybody would would like. But that's sort of the nature of the beast. Yes. How does our Asian Asian carp? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, Asian carp, um, I, I first of all describe them as a symptom of our nutrient problem. They, they thrive here because there's plenty to eat. Um, right now the species that we have do not actively feed on freshwater mussels. However, there is a species called the um, um, black carp that does eat mussel species. It does eat mussels, and so it is knocking at our door, and that will be another another cut to the population when they get here. And I don't think it's a win; I think it's an if. So, um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, is there any attempt to kill or control Asian carp? I mean, are we doing that? <laughs> <laughs> ah, um, well, I mean, it's it's open season on them. If you want to eat them, you know, you're you can catch them and eat them. It's just that no one really wants to, and there haven't been there have there are attempts in other places to develop markets um, related to um, animal feed and you know some niche you know markets. But um, I don't I'm not aware of any like really um, a, a strong effort in that regard. I mentioned that. Um, there are 151 species of fish in the Wabash, and three of them are gone. One of those is the alligator gar. And alligator gar is a huge fish that presumably would eat a lot of Asian carp, but it's gone. However, in 2016, there is no season on that fish anymore because it's gone. Someone killed one in a, an Oxbow Lake um, in Knox County. And uh, he did the right thing. He called the DNR and said, I've, I've caught something that I don't think I should have caught, but I didn't know it, you know. And so the, that fish was released in um, 2009 in Kentucky. So it was eight years, I think, later. And it was a five foot long fish. First of all, that could get to Indiana because we don't have dams. That's pretty exciting. Kentucky is releasing them specifically to address Asian carp. And so it found a home here and, and was probably doing that here. Now, they're not they're not uh, discriminating on what fish they eat, but there's so many Asian carp, you have to think that's gonna be what they favor because that's the most prolific thing. So 
that's not going to fix the problem, but that having a system that's whole and intact yeah. helps. So just always thinking about system health. What are the other two that's the... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know them, but I can't... I, I, I probably have it in my notes here, actually. They're small. A, alligator gar is the one that kind of gets your attention, but yeah. Not that, not that that's a reason not to know what they are, that they're small. Most of the things we well, have are. Is there... Do you have a sense of over the timeline, say, of, you know, from settlement to present day, how uh, the population, I and mean, was there a big drop off though, and the were polluted industrially, and, and uh, is it worse uh, now with all the herbicides? No, I think, I think river conditions are better water quality wise now than they were in the 70s, for sure. Um, but I think um, it's this it's this destabilization of our s substrates and the, you know, river banks, you know, the the Increased, so yeah. Um, so, so yeah. I think I think water quality in general is better, and I think these things have held. They're tough. They've held on. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think um, you know they certainly. I've found mussels that were sort of like, how did this get here? And it had to be you know a flood kind of thing. But in general, they also where they live in the river is kind of. They're, they're deep down in the water. So, you know, when the flood comes through, it's, it's a lot, there's a lot more velocity at the top of the water column than down where they are. So but, when they're, when they're, they're in bed, typically, mm -hmm. is that because the water fell there and then dried and didn't in other places? No, it's that they, they fell in this whole stretch and this is where the good substrate was. Yeah. And where I, and this one that fell here is, okay, yeah. yeah. And it may have, it may have, you know, washed on down to the next good bed, but. It depends on the type, whether it's gravel or sand or. And, and certain mussels like different. Yeah. yeah. There, there's so much variety. No, no clear cut answers. It's all nuanced, but yeah. Yes. Well, I was just going to say, they did put up a levee in Fort Wayne, on the south side of Fort Wayne, to cut the Asian car off so it can't transfer to the Wabash to the Maumee River. Yes. And I've heard there's a. Electric fence in another area where they're trying to Chicago. do the same thing. Mm -hmm. they're trying to mm -hmm. cut them off, but they aren't where they're at. They're at. Right, mm -hmm. and I, I think um, it doesn't take very many people thinking, well, it would be fun to mess with the system and put a, an Asian carp in the, one of the Great Lakes. I, I can't believe it hasn't happened, but um, I think yeah, it's a matter of time. That's what the levy in Fort Wayne is to keep them out of the Great yeah, it's the one place, like it's that highest point where the Wabash and the, they could communicate. Um, it's a marsh. It's a yeah. big marsh and they built a, a levee right down the middle. Yeah. 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 Has anyone uh, done any studies on the thermal pollution that have come off of the power plants or the cooling belts and how that raises the temperature? I mean, I don't know if it freezes anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they don't like, not having that winter where they can kind of rest and not. Yeah. I'm not familiar with any studies that have looked at that specifically related to freshwater mussels, um, but I would think, you know, right in the downstream area, there's probably not a lot of anything, you know, just because of the the change in temperature, you know, the the shock, I guess, to this system. Because it seems that's where you find a lot of the carp too. They really like those problems mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I like warm too. I, I can't <laughs> blame them, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know of any studies. That doesn't mean they aren't out there. Yes. Nancy, at the exhibit, I saw something about invasive mussel species. Is that something you can speak to? Um, I can only speak to zebra mussels and sort of that invasion. That's what I that the exhibit. Yeah, um, and so a lot of our um, rivers, you know, have them, uh, and I think you know it's been twenty plus years now that they we had that invasion, cleared up the Great Lakes, you know, so. I'm talking about our freshwater mussels and how much they filter, and the zebra mussels filter a lot of water too, and they do clean things up. But they made the Great Lakes so that there's not enough food for the native things that live there. But those things, 
uh, not that they aren't still a threat, but they really have crashed. They, they kind of had their invasion, did well, ate up all the food in the Great Lakes at least, and, and crashed. Um, I, I mentioned the tip of canoe is a good river for mussels. It's good for zebra mussels too, and a lot of the shells there you find the zebras on. And they can, you know, cause some um, detriment to our native mussels. So um, again, there's enough food. They're not going to deplete. I can't imagine a time when they would deplete the food source, but what are they, the question is, what are they hurting? What diseases are they harboring um, that have sort of a secondary um, attack on our... I, they don't need a fish for their, yeah. They're, a, uh, they're not a North American muscle. And there is potentially one North American muscle that doesn't need a fish. Um, well, there's one that uses salamanders, so mud puppies. And then there's another that the fish host, there's probably multiples that the fish host isn't known for, but the three horn warty back, they think it might not use a fish, but it's not, that's not for sure. When you um, say their food, is it used by like algae in the water or? What do you mean, food? Well, I mean, they filter the water for their food, but mm -hmm. their food would consist of what might? Like, algae and bacteria, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, e. coli, they, you know, that's, that's a concern in a lot of Indiana water, um, and they can process that and do just fine. Yeah. In your remarks about extinction, it, it seemed to me that you were saying, how, how does North America fare versus the rest of the world in freshwater mussels? So, well, um, North America is where you get the greatest diversity of freshwater mussels in the world. We are the epicenter. Eastern U.S. is the epicenter. Is that, out, because, is that because we're not fished out? Uh, no, no. It, it, historically, uh, through time, we because of all the fresh water that's here. So Alabama is the uh, pinnacle of diversity. And uh, a lot of that has to do with all these little streams. So there's really... Um, they call it endemic, you know, mussels that are endemic to, you know, this little watershed kind of thing. Um, but it it's, speaks to how much fresh water is here. Now, I can't give you the numbers for, Asia would, would be a rival um, for sure, but it, it doesn't, it isn't anywhere close. Um, and so I think there's almost 300 species that are native to um, North America, and it's not anywhere like that, those other places. So it, the reason, my point with that slide was that eight of the 20 extinctions are with freshwater mussels, and that's precisely because we have so much diversity to lose of that animal group. I don't want to keep you guys longer, so don't feel like you have to sit here and if you have other things you need to do. Yes? Well, one, I just want to say I'm grateful to know these presentations are being um, filmed. So you said this was your biggest turnout, but this was so full of information that I could watch it again. Oh, so thank you. Other people will be able to see it. Yeah, I, I'm glad to know it's recorded too, because I don't think some of them have been. So. But I know at one point this land was covered with glacial silt. Does that have anything in relationship to the the only, I don't, I can't speak much to that. Uh, the one thing I will say is that the. Um, the, what we call, what I call the central till plain, which is central Indiana, pretty where we are here is probably right on the edge. Um, and, and so uh, there is a lot of diversity of mussels in that, uh, there historically was, in that central um, till plain um, portion of Indiana. So I have to think that the, that the glaciers didn't harm what was here. It may have, may, it may have, um, um, I don't want to say stranded or, or forced, you know, some things to maybe live in one place and not another. But um, it wasn't it wasn't harmful in any way, and probably, in fact, was a good thing. Yes. You touched on mighty the the grape cover crop adoption down in southern Indiana and the riparian buffers and mm -hmm. no-till and all that great work going down in southern Indiana. So, what can um, like us as citizens or this part of Indiana do to mm. learn more about cover crops and um, increase the adoption rate? Here. Oh my gosh, what a good question. If I knew the answer to that, I would be rich. <laughs> um, 
So, and I and I didn't mean to say that that was only a Southern Indiana thing because that's not that, that, right. And, and Southern Indiana, in some cases, does well because our topography, it, it, those those you know, I, I live on a family farm. I know you do no-till because otherwise your soil is gone. Versus you know, central and northern Indiana, it's flat and it's it's going to always you know the mindset of I think it's always going to be there. So um, I think. Uh, a couple of things, Jane. One, um, people own land that they are, they don't farm themselves. Um, and, and maybe some of you in this room even maybe farm, or you maybe have a family farm, but you don't farm it. Someone else does. Ask them to plant cover crops. Uh, that's not happening in Indiana. And that's one of the biggest keys we think to getting adoption is that having the people who are interested enough to sit in this room and, and learn about our rivers actually think about how what they may be doing or what their you know someone else in their family may be doing to to talk to them about that um, we the nature conservancy does own some properties that have a little bit of farmland on them and we have um, incorporated into our leases that they must use uh, con conservation cover and no-till or at least reduced till and in some cases there's been some pushback on that but the alternative is that we'll find someone who will do that and so that you know um, we have examples of of lease language if anybody wants that so that there's that um, and then you know just you, you're local you know the people who are growing uh, food here talk to them about you know their decisions and um, why they choose to to do what they do or don't and, and a lot of times there's good reasons I've talked to someone in Shelbyville recently who doesn't He's a non-operating landowner. He plants his crop, but he relies on someone else to harvest it. And he can't plant cover crops because they harvest too late in the season for the cover crops to get established. So I'm thinking, why don't we fly those cover <coughs> crops on instead of planting them? There's people that do that. Um, so creativity. But you have, to, you have to have those conversations and be listening to understand, to know what the, everybody has a little bit different resistance or reason. And it, it um, is, um, can be costly in the first few years. It, does, it may not be profitable, but it is profitable in the long run, and we you know, have research to show that. Um, so think about ways to bridge that gap, those, you know, that few years of, of ad adoption to, of trying something to actually adopting it and believing in it. Are there state and federal funds to help with those first few years? There are. Um, I don't know, I don't know for, you have a 319 grant here? We do for the Arctic watershed. Yeah. Um, I would think there would be, you could definitely get funds, organized funds that way. Um, but also, um, oh, we need to talk more. <laughs> um, yes, there, there are, but I can't tell you program names, but yes. Oh, good. And everything, but they have to purchase the rollers. There's a lot more equipment that goes yes. into it, which is huge expenditure. You do not get any money for that. Around here, our taxes are so high that you cannot make a profit if you're just not doing corner to corner farming. It's unfortunate that that's just our county taxes that we go are so high that you barely can pay your taxes and your insurance and continue to remain in you know, ownership of your property. Ah. And it also goes down to whoever the uh, firm offices are, how much they want to work with the people to get it. You know, like if you're bidding for conservation reserve program property, mm -hmm. if your farm office isn't really into that, they're not going to push your bids as high as some other counties that are into that. So that's also another component. Of you're, you're saying you're um, your NRCS office? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And relationships with, with them in your soil and water district, you know that, are... Are so that's why you see it in some counties that have a lot more, and mm. other counties don't have it here as much as the student Interesting. In mean, the 30 years I've lived in, in rural Rio County, I've just seen more and more land that's farm by uh, not, not by the owner. Yeah. They don't, and the erosion, and, and, and it's just, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. There, there is something to a land ethic, and if you yeah, own well, it. Uh, there's just machine jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. Shame. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry, we've got a room reservation coming up in here. <laughs> yeah. We need to stop it because it's so interesting. Well, and thank I, you very much. yeah, thank you guys. Great thank questions, you. and um, I really appreciate it.